have our scripture reading. Today's text comes from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. You may find your seats, and we will go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, it's with great joy that we come again to praise your holy name. And we are so thankful for the privilege of worshiping you and singing to, uh, as well as reading scripture. A reminder, Lord, that one day that we will hear from your voice the truth of all that is, and we thank you for that time. We look forward to it. We anticipate that time when we can be gathered together as one from every nation, tongue, and tribe, kneeling and praising and rejoicing before our very glorious and awesome Savior. And so we thank you for these moments that we come, we can have here on Sundays, Lord, just to worship you, to remind ourselves of what is to come. And these little glimpses, Lord, that kind of fuel us to be faithful. And in the midst of that, we pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to just control our hearts and minds, that we would be quickened, not only, Lord, to want to do rightly and to live a holy life, but to be encouraged to press on, to have joy that fills our souls, and to be prepared as well to receive from your word so that we might honor you further. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, in the midst of a very crooked and perverse generation in which we find ourselves, that you will complete the work that you have begun in us, that you are faithful and just, and that you will accomplish these things for your glory's sake. And we are so grateful for that, and we give you praise for that. And this morning, I just want to lift up these, my brothers and sisters and friends who have come into this worship service, and pray, Father, that you would quiet their souls from the hardships of life that they might be facing right now, that you would encourage them in the paths in which they find themselves, and that the joy that they might be experiencing and good times of life might be also measured by the greater joy that we want to have with you. I pray for those who have come, Lord, would you answer their prayer requests? Would you, Lord Jesus, show them that you hear the groaning of their soul in the middle of the night when they have nothing else around them to distract them, and it's just stillness? Please make yourself known to them in strength and encouragement and in power by bringing to mind the Word of God or some kind act that God's people have done for them that they might be strengthened. And I pray, Lord, that you would answer their prayers according to their need and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. Thank you for the other churches in the city that are being faithful to proclaim the name of Jesus. Lord, fill their worship services with your power, we pray. Cause your face to be among our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they might be just elevated to a place of joy and anticipation of what you will do through those times together. Bring revival to our churches, Lord. Change us more into your image. Cause us to be a greater, stronger light in our communities. And for every church, Lord, that is not being faithful to preach and proclaim and to serve the Lord, please mercifully bring your conviction to them in power. And if they will not turn, please remove the voice that they have in this community. That they might not influence people more towards unrighteousness and that they might not distract from the glorious and mighty name that we worship now, the name of Christ our Savior. Lord, I pray now that you'd fill me for what needs to be done, that what would be seen would be Christ and his cross and his resurrection and the hope that we have in you and none else. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, wonderful to worship with you this morning. The Lord bless you and give you peace. Uh, we are in uh, Revelation, actually chapter 21 and 22, 
as you can see from our text. And the reason we read Psalm chapter 126 uh, was because that basically anticipates the spirit of what will happen in uh, in Revelation. Now, what drove me to do a little mini uh, message here on heaven, uh, and most of you don't know, but our church has basically officiated and, and served uh, several families over the last 10 days uh, with funerals. So we've had three funerals in the last 10 days, and uh, it's just a good time to be thinking about what God's going to do when we get into his presence, because all of us one day will stand before the presence of the Lord and give account for our lives. All of us one day will find our spot in a funeral home, not observing, but being observed. And we must, with the power and strength of God, look forward to the day when we will actually stand before him full and without pain and suffering. And so I want to spend some time kind of working through the one place where we have as much information as we can find on heaven. There are tidbits that are scattered throughout the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament. And not only that, but there are some major themes that seem to culminate in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 regarding the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, but heaven's just an amazing place, uh, as we might anticipate. It is intended to motivate us. This information is really intended to motivate us to be more faithful, to drive more deeply into our Christian walk, and uh, to seek the Lord with urgency. Now, I understand that when we come to Revelation, uh, as you might have understood from the last 13 years of me being here, that it's not a book I normally light upon to speak. I think I spent some time dealing with chapters 1, 2, and 3, which is essentially Jesus speaking to the churches. And as you can see now, I'm jumping all the way over to the end because the middle sometimes I find terribly confusing. Anybody there with Revelation? I mean, it's really, it's an amazing book. It's just so full of imagery uh, and so full of pretty, some, some pretty amazing stories that, uh, that sometimes you're just kind of scratching your head. And that's not necessarily because there's something erroneous there or something that God, that God is uh, or that John the Apostle is necessarily making up at all. God is speaking through him. Uh, it is that God wants to awaken our minds and our consciences in a certain way. Uh, so here's what I want to do this morning as we kind of jump into uh, Revelation. I want to basically uh, try to give you some tools that might be helpful as you dive into Revelation yourself, and uh, hopefully that will help you as you're reading through to to reach for uh, some tools that will kind of walk you through some more scriptures. I think we'll be able to talk about that a little bit. I also want to deal with the text as we did last week with Ruth. We kind of, I have the text here in my, in my PowerPoint, and we're going to kind of make some scribbles and make some notes on it just so that we can comprehend what's going on. And at the end of that time, I want to give us some takeaways with respect to some things that we can apprehend from this very amazing book uh, of Revelation, especially regarding heaven in that glorious place that God has provided for us and is preparing for us even as we speak. So let's spend some time looking at the tools that God has given us. And the tools are really are pretty simple. If you go back to Revelation chapter 1, the first thing we consider is, is basically who the author is and what he's doing and what, what he's saying about himself. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant the things that must soon take place. Okay, so God the Father is speaking to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, go tell John what I'm going to do. John, you're going to tell the churches. And we find as well that John is in the Isle of Patmos as we continue to kind of uh, read further on. But the intent of this whole particular section is to charge the churches, to prepare them, and to help them understand what's going to happen. The intent is always very important as we're reading Scripture. Otherwise, we will be uh, driven to our own perspectives as to what we see. I remember uh, being in English class in high school several years ago. <laughs> and my professor looked at us and he said, what does the text speaking about Shakespeare. But, but what does it mean to you? You see, the, the problem with that kind of a philosophy is that we become the center point for all understanding. And John has something specific to say. Jesus Christ has something he wants us to understand, and it's given by God the Father so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what Dave thinks. It matters what God thinks. So when we come under this uh, particular teaching, we understand that John is being motivated to communicate something about Christ and what he's doing with his church and what he's doing in history. But we find out in chapter 1 that he's actually dealing with the, uh, or he he's said that he's actually on the Isle of Patmos, and that might not necessarily mean anything to us except for, historically speaking, the Isle of Patmos was basically uh, a place where you were, you were confined. It was, it was uh, imprisonment, in, in a sense. It was the Alcatraz without prison, if you can imagine it. So there's just this little island. You can't get off the island. 
And there, the Lord mercifully begins to show John. And he's there specifically because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so it's not because he's going to go plant churches there. It's because he is being taken there because he is a Christian and has been faithful with the gospel of Jesus. And so on the onset, if I might just present this to you as something to encourage your soul, uh, it's not uncommon for the Lord to show us some measure of grace by awakening us to his truth uh, in those moments when we find ourselves in the most difficult times of hardship. Have you ever found yourself in this time of great oppression in your life with respect to all the things that are kind of landing on you? And, and you're just wondering what to do, and you go through the scriptures, or you pick up a devotional, and it's like, I've read these things a million times, but now I see what it's supposed to t- teach me. And the Lord mercifully uh, does that for us, and he's certainly showing John a particular amount of grace by revealing these things to him. Paul the Apostle speaks often about the fact that Christ revealed himself to him in order that he might be strengthened and be faithful to what God had called him to do. So we understand these things, and that kind of brings us a a sense of, okay, I I have to make sure I'm being faithful to the context. And the other thing we need to see is that John uses a a tremendous amount of imagery here. And the the, the reason we need to make sure we understand context first is because otherwise, you know, we're going to really say some things about the imagery that really aren't so. I had one person tell me one time that he thought that the uh, the, these grasshopper things, scorpion things that stung you for six months were Apache helicopters. And I kind of looked around and I didn't say anything. And after I was just scratching my head like, what did he just say? What building did he fall off of before he started teaching these things? Uh, the imagery uh, would make some pretty incredible tattoos to be sure. But there is a reason for that imagery, and that is, uh, I think, oftentimes to protect the content that's here. Remember, Paul, or John, is on the Isle of Patmos. What's the purpose of him being there? He has been taken there, basically, to be in prison. If you want to communicate something about what God is going to do in history, and part of that is to say that Rome is terrible, and God's going to bring judgment upon her, that's probably not going to make it off the island in the weekly mail, or however else they sent that information. And so there's imagery here to captivate us and to cause us as Christians to look more deeply. But we have to be careful with how we understand imagery, because the thing about imagery is that it it is oftentimes interpreted by the scriptures, and it's oftentimes interpreted by the author himself, and by principles of scripture. And so when we don't have those three elements, we just have to rest in the hands of the Lord. Remember what Paul tells us uh, in Corinthians, that right now we see through a dark glass, and we just can't quite see everything that's there. I mean, we can make some shapes out, but we're not quite sure how everything fits together. And imagery is much like that. Remember Paul the Apostle before, or excuse me, Peter, before he actually goes and acts and speaks to the, or to the Italian cohort that's there, um, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Italian uh, general that's there that he's going to go basically share the gospel with. God has to prepare his soul. And so Peter's sitting there hungry, and he's praying on top of the rooftop, and this, this image comes down okay, from heaven. And it's all sorts of creatures that aren't suitable for a Jewish person to eat. They're all unclean. And God says, kill and eat. If we apply the same principles of imagery to that story that we often apply to Revelation, we're going to think that God's going to just, you know, he's basically commanding something that's a little bit different than what actually is the end result of that commandment or of that teaching. Do you remember what the end result of that teaching was? Was that these Gentiles came up and Peter was supposed to go with them. And he says, now I understand that I'm not to call anything unclean, which God calls clean. If we just stick with the literal interpretation of that imagery, we're thinking about all these different wild beasts that we're supposed to be killing. And you can almost see Peter saying, all right, there's one. Go get him, John. we got to eat this thing. But that's not the teaching at all. We we are governed and we are encouraged by uh, really an understanding of imagery uh, by how the Scripture in general teaches us. Imagine what, for example, the wife of Song of Solomon would look like if we didn't spend time considering the intent of the imagery. So just a couple things as descriptors that are there, and I give you kind of the paraphrase version. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Your teeth are like female sheep that have been shorn. Your nose and neck are like a tower. And your belly is a heap of wheat. And you smell like spice, the spice aisle. <laughs> That is certainly not going to make a Valentine's Day card in any country at any time. Imagery is pretty amazing, but it can take us off the path that God would have us go if we're not careful. 
So I would say this, that not all imagery in Revelation will make sense to us until we experience it or see it when we get into the presence of God. And that's terribly important. First Peter chapter 1, the prophets that were trying to, they were prophesying about the coming of the Lord Jesus and the suffering that would follow are looking at God saying, when does this happen? And God tells them that they were not serving themselves but another generation. It was not for them to know all those details. And so it is with us as we look at imagery that is not for us to know all the details that are there, but we can make some, some principal points or some points that are principled for us to grow in. We can see the power and the work of God in such a way where we can be encouraged with respect to how we are to move and understand what God would have us do through these stories. So let's spend some time looking at the text, shall we? And the first thing we look at in the text, chapter 21, verse 1, then I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, so this is important because it, it helps us understand and apprehend what Jesus Christ intended with all the teaching of actually making all things new. What does he say about the heaven and the earth that we see ourselves in right now? They have passed away. Interestingly enough as well, we see that the sea was no more. Uh, so basically the world as we know it is gone, and for some reason God has determined not to actually include a sea or an ocean uh, in this new heaven and a new earth, and we're not really sure why. Uh, it might be potentially because uh, the sea is the one thing that divides all the nations. What we see here later on in this text is that the nations are coming together finally under the glory of Jesus Christ to worship him, and there's perfect harmony there. Uh, we might also think about the fact that uh, not only uh, does the sea divide, but also it is the one thing that God used, that water was the first act of judgment uh, that was brought upon the world in totality, if you remember that from Genesis chapter 6. We don't really know, but we know that God has created something amazing. It's new. It's never been in or lived in by anyone else. We're not going to find under its dirt a bunch of ancient civilizations and a bunch of writings from people that were there before. This is completely new. There's no evil history, and everything that happens in this place is going to be full of joy and peace. It is a holy city. It is a new Jerusalem which is really quite fascinating because it tells us something of what God intended with the promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that this is beyond just some ethnic group that received the truth of who God was. This was for all of God's people throughout time for his glory to be able to manifest in the city that they might grow in him. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Okay, so this is, this is something that God has prepared, okay? Now, when we see it's coming from the Lord, and we see as well that it says a bride adorned for her husband, there are several passages of Scripture that come to mind. This is language that's used all the way through. So remember, we're talking about imagery here. And one of the first things we have to remember is Genesis chapter 2. There is not a, man, or there's, there's not a helper fit for uh, Adam, and so God prepares Eve and brings Eve as a gift to Adam. And the amazing thing is that the, Old, the New Testament starts to look at Jesus Christ as the true Adam, the second Adam, that will fulfill all of the promises of God, that will stand before the presence of God and take the full power of God's wrath upon himself for the sake of his bride. And as a consequence of that, then God takes these people that have knelt down in the presence of the Lord and surrendered to his grace and believed in him by faith, and he transforms them. And now he brings those people to his son as a bride prepared for her husband. The imagery is amazing. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. So as you go through Revelation, there are several things that actually take place. There are angels that make noise and trumpets, as we see. Uh, we can see in a moment angels that are just communicating something of God's glory and grace. Uh, there's all these different players in Revelation that are representing things that are going to take place. This is coming from the throne of God. The mouth of God saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with who? That's amazing. Think about who we are. Think about what Isaiah 6 says about the angels in heaven, that they are absolutely amazed and captivated by the glory of God. That's the kind of glory that God lives with and will always live with, and that's the kind of glory that God brings into this new heaven and new earth so that he might live with his people. 
So it's not just a one-time thing. It's not like in the Old Testament, you can come into my holy tabernacle and temple into the Holy of Holies one time after you sacrifice a bull or a goat. I'm going to dwell with you. And I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. What a glorious thing that will be. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things, again, have passed away. The earth, the old earth, is the former things. It has passed away. There's the connection point with verse 1. We don't have to worry about this anymore. The concerns we have as people living in this world uh, really fall upon the mercies of God who has made a new heaven and a new earth. We don't have to worry about the things that can get us and cause us to have pain and frustration and difficulty in our lives. But there's something actually here that's even more powerful uh, than that even. And I would say as we consider this, the concepts of the holy city as compared to uh, the other cities of man. I talked about Genesis chapter 2 as being a point of connection with this particular section. What about Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, where all these people gather together, remember, and they, they say to themselves, let us build a tower all the way up to heaven. I mean, the earth is full of violence at this time. It's a horrible place, and God actually has to come down. It says in the text, let's go see what man is doing. And they God comes down from heaven. That language is used to communicate how small we really are, but how big we think we are. We're going to go to heaven. All the cities of man are always in competition with God. That's the point. We're always competing with him, but in this particular case, there's harmony. This particular case, this city, this new Jerusalem is a place where God wants to dwell and that his people want to dwell with him. And that's where you and I are going, my friends. As Christians, this is what awaits you and me. As Christians, this is the joy that we have. All the fears that we bring to the table on any given day are not experiences that will take place in heaven. We are his people. Again, reaching back to the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 20, Ezekiel chapter 37, 23, Ezekiel chapter 37, 27, Zechariah 8, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Hebrews 8, 10, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. All of them speak about the fact that we are the people of God who have trusted and rested in Him. That's so important, loved ones that we belong to the God who causes all this justice to take place and who has the power not only to destroy this world and all that is wrecked in it, but to make a new one where we can live with joy and peace in His presence for eternity. You belong to God, my friends. However difficult your life might be, however crazy your relationships might be here on this earth, at work, in your marriage, with your kids, if you are a believer, you belong to God, and heaven awaits you. And so we see from the next particular section, John, who's sitting there in prison, basically, on this island. What's going to happen now? He keeps looking. He keeps watching and observing, looking for God's mercy through these things he's being taught. And so verse 5 says, and he who was seated on the throne. Okay, when you look at this language right here in the scriptures, whenever we see God seated, it's a concept of judgment. It's a concept of, de of declaration as one who's an authority and power. And he was seated on the throne. Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true, Okay. That God is always true in his speaking, and he just wants to underscore that. What does he say about himself? It's done. Now, that's not the same word that Jesus Christ uses on the cross. It's a different word that's there. It's in the perfect tense, which communicates something of the continuation of this particular uh, act of God. But it does help us think about the work that was begun with Jesus Christ in the cross, when after he had been uh, the, the, re the recipient of all the evil of this world, all the sins of mankind, and the wrath of God being dr just drowning him with full force, what does he say? It is finished. Our salvation is complete. Now that was the work that needed to be done to begin this work that God was going to do, which is encompassed in this word, it is done. He began all of this 
in his promise to Adam and Eve that one will come who will crush Satan's head, and now he's consummating it. And he says about himself, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. What is he saying there? He says, everything starts and ends with me. I am the source of all things. I have always been in control. However crazy our life gets, God is still on the throne. He is still ruling and he's still watching over you, my friends. And what does he say? Are you thirsty? I will give springs of water of life without payment. What does that text remind you of? John chapter 5, the woman at the well, five husbands living with a guy who's not her husband. I will give you living water. All the things that you look to in this life to kind of satisfy your soul, I'm the one that does that. I'm going to conquer all these things. I'm going to bless you. And so he says, the one who conquers will have this heritage. And what does the conquering thing mean with respect to Christians? Basically, that's a concept of discontinuation. He who is faithful to the end shall be saved. The perseverance of the saints, that communication of truth. It's the ones that get off the boat that aren't really truly Christians. It's the one who say, I'm going to stay on this hard road so that I might find Jesus. Those are the ones who will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, and here's the warning, it's not just this goodness but those who find themselves now in this life cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, where will their portion be? A lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, that anticipates something in that concept with the second death. Let's talk about that a little bit. Because what we are communicating here now, what we're understanding is actually a different realm, okay? Uh, we can't say of hell that it's a literal, physical uh, experience like we can experience here. We are in the spiritual realm. And what, what we also understand is that everybody who lives will now be found in that presence. But there is a physical aspect to this. Uh, there is a physical aspect that will actually satisfy every need for justice that God requires. And we will experience every aspect of reality now in, in, in the physical that is there and in the spiritual, so that we can experience the perfect execution of God's justice. That's pretty amazing. In this particular world, there are things that we just can't apprehend because of our senses. So a few years ago, or not a few years ago, sorry, I just get used to saying a few years ago because everything seems like forever. Over uh, Christmas, our whole family got COVID. And I've always been like the, you know, superpower sniffer in our family. You know, I can smell things a mile bef away before they actually come and, and get a hold of everybody. My nose still isn't right. It's still not adapted to the things that are there. There are things in this world that just because of the, the, the life that we experience, you know, there's just an aspect of that even though we have all the equipment that should be working, it doesn't always work. In heaven, every part of our physical being will be attuned to what God wants to say and do. So much so that even our spiritual life is, is brought into that in perfection. And so if we stand in the presence of God without Christ, we will experience all of that without inhibition. All of that justice and all that wrath that was poured out on Christ. This is a warning to you and to me. As much as we are made perfect and righteous before the Lord, those who have bowed their knee to the Lord and, and submitted to Him and have this heritage of beauty, those who reject are warned here in this particular text, this is not for them. But it's also an encouragement to God's people. You pull up the news and you see more horrors. When will it ever finish? You ever had to just pull off of reading the news because it's just depressing? Imagine never having news to pull up because there's nothing wrong going on in your world. Heaven is a place of peace. Heaven is a place where there's no more suffering. And even the glory of God being so amazing that understanding that there's a perfect justice going on with people who have rejected him, we are still full of joy. How glorious must his glory be? So we'll just kind of press on a little bit more. One more thing, if I can come back to this, not to you know, keep beating this drum, but I think it's important. Uh, there's a lot of songs that are really cool that talk about hell being a party. <laughs> you know, they're just, I don't know what it is about songs that are just their lyrics are just 
totally anti-Christian, but they're the ones that stick in your head the most, right? It's like they got the best, the best rhythms, they got the best guitar riffs, they've got all this stuff, and they're just horrible songs. There are several things that our culture says about what hell is going to be. It's going to be a party, it's a place where Satan's in charge, it's just going to be so much fun. God's in charge of that place. And it's a place of perfect justice. Satan is bound and he is charged with all of the crimes that he has done. And he's experiencing all of that in that place where the Lord will cause all those who hate him to fall. God's justice will be as perfect in the execution of it as it will be in the mercy he shows to us when we stand in his presence. So we move along to verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues. Okay, so these, these things right here, you kind of have to get some context going back. There's all these different kinds of, if you're familiar with Revelation, there's all these different kinds of judgments that God pours out on the earth, and they're seen with bowls and trumpets and different things like this. But look at what this says. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So it's reaching back to the, basically, Ephesians chapter 5, for instance. If you remember that particular passage where Paul is communicating to his, to his people, this is what a marriage should look like as a Christian marriage. Uh, wives submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ in all things. And husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And then all this information as to how Jesus Christ actually sacrificed uh, his life and served the church in fullness. It's just really pretty amazing. But at the end of that, Paul says, I speak a mystery. Because this is about the relationship between Jesus and his church. It's pretty fascinating, actually, if you look at that particular context of Scripture. And now we have the privilege of actually seeing the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That's you and me that have been prepared. But notice what he says. He carried, away, he carried me away in the Spirit. And this language is language that is common in Old Testament prophecy. To a great high mountain and showed me, what? The holy city. He's going to show him the land and shows him the holy city down, coming down from heaven. And this holy city, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like, a ja like jasper, like clear crystal. It had great high walls and twelve gates, and at the twelve gates, twelve angels, and at the gates, names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates, and the north three gates, and the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the apostle of the Lamb. So, how are we to understand this? Is this really an, an image that communicates something about the church? Is it something that communicates about Jerusalem? What's the relationship that's there? And the problem is that, that we have um, basically John receiving that this is language that's used for both Jerusalem and for his church. If we just say that it's all allegorical, then we're kind of missing the fact that there, there is a very real description of a city that can be measured and that has landmarks and it's adorned with all sorts of costly ornaments. Uh, so we miss that particular portion of Scripture. And I think there's much to be said here. Remember when I went back to say that we kind of, we, we, we look through a glass and it's kind of dimmed? This is one of those passages where we're gonna, it's going to be dimmed, okay? We're just, we just can't see it all. But here are some things that I think might be helpful. We have to remember that Jesus promises to prepare a place for us. So this new Jerusalem is our home. It's our place of identification. It's a place we can fully appreciate and experience. Further, it has to be a place where God is willing to live with his people. And we see from the Old Testament literature that everything that surrounds God and his presence is alive. That's fascinating, actually. You know, I would direct you to Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 2 for more understanding on that. The throne and the eyes that are on the throne and all these different kinds of things that just see and experience and, and, and are integrated with the communication of God's truth and all of that. It's fascinating. And then we tie that in with language that's in First Peter that underscores that we might, consider, uh, we might be considered as an architectural uh, working of God. Remember what he says? You are living stones being fit together. It's pretty fascinating. So what does this basically mean? Uh, what I am suggesting to you is not that we are uh, a bunch of rocks that God's kind of building up, okay? But I am suggesting to you that there's something special. There's some sort of symbiotic relationship here. Uh, not that the city's dependent upon us and, or that God's dependent upon us in that sense, but there's a relationship there that is amazing that can't even be described for its glory and its worth to you and to me. I mean, what would heaven be like if you could under, apprehend it, understand it now fully and totally? It'd be pretty boring, wouldn't it? It's like, yeah, I got it. No need to go there. 
So God gives us language that leaves us wondering, wow, what is this place like? What kind of experiences are we going to have in His presence? And it's in contrast to hell, the city of torment, if we could say. There's a city of holiness and there's a city of torment where all who have not bowed the knee will find themselves. It reminds us of John chapter 3, verse 16, verse 8, with respect to the two cities. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So, John is looking at this. He's looking for the bride, and he's looking for this amazing... Uh, display of grace that God is showing to this angel, and what does he focus his attention on? After all this measuring that he's put there, he focuses his attention on, uh, if I can get there, there it is, the city where there's no temple. What sticks out in Jerusalem of all things for John? This is pre, probably pre-destruction of Jerusalem. Maybe it's after. I'm not, we're not quite sure as far as the dating for Revelation. But you would expect that in Jerusalem, there's a place where you worship God, right? It's a big deal. Right now, we look at Jerusalem, we find all these different things, and it's the Wailing Wall. That's where we anticipate where that foundation is laid, and it's not there. We're not sure exactly how all those things are going to play out. But we would expect that there is a place of worship that is focused, that is important for God's people. But what do we see with the New Jerusalem? There's no place of worship. Why? Because the whole place is a place of worship. Because everywhere we go, the deepest experiences and meanings that we can have with God are experienced fully everywhere with God's people at all times. There's, there's, this, is, this is the temple. Is, the temple is the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb. There's no sacrifices there. Those are complete we are there because of the mercy of Jesus Christ. We are there because we have His righteousness. We are made holy so that we can stand there. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The glory and the Lamb, right? This is who we see. This is who motivates us. This is what brings life to our walk. By its light, the nations will walk. And kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So this is speaking of all those from every nation, tongue, and tribe that will be in the presence of God. They bring their glory and their honor of the nations, but no one clean. And this is a mercy to you and to me. We never have to worry about who might bust into our house at night. Wouldn't that be amazing? God is watching over us, and he has prepared a place that is perfect in its protection where we do not have to fear ever again. What an amazing place this must be. Do we look forward to it? What else do we see? That the angel showed them a river of water of life flowing from the throne of God. All life comes from Him. And of the Lamb through the middle of the street, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, we began the whole narrative of redemption in Genesis in a garden where someone stole, Adam and Eve, fruit they were not supposed to eat. Of all that they could eat of the king's garden, they chose the one tree where he said, don't eat of this. And now we find, mercifully at the end of this narrative, the tree of life that brings healing and fruit in each month. There's this ecological healing and there's this uh, imagery going back to the Old Testament. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. Again, how many times does he have to say that nothing bad's going to happen to underscore the glory that he's in? And I wonder if Paul or John is kind of coming in and out of this vision in some sense and looking around thinking, man, I'm still on the Isle of Patmos. It was, that was pretty, pretty amazing what I just saw, but I'm waking up still on the Isle of Patmos. They will see who? His face. And his name will be on their foreheads. All night will be no more. They will need no lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be the light, and they will reign forever and ever. So, some quick takeaways that I think are important as we look at this. And the first is this that heaven is first about enjoying God with his people. Why is that important? 
Because otherwise, heaven is about all the experiences that we can have. And those compete with the ultimate glory that God wants displayed in his life and in this world. It also underscores something about our own desires and nature. Loved ones, this is the one place where we can actually have a little bit of a glimpse of heaven when we're with God's people worshiping because this is what's going to happen for eternity where we can speak about the mercy and the glory of God, where we can sing songs that celebrate his name, where we can enjoy every ethnic group that knows Jesus Christ from every nation, tongue, and tribe, and there is perfect harmony. This is the one place where we are gathered around the gospel to the glory of Jesus Christ. So if that's what heavens is going to be like and we hate this place, guess what we're not? We're not Christians or we've been terribly distracted by this world. You and I should love the gathering of God's people. You and I should long for these times where we can rejoice and praise His holy name, where we can have this experience of this communal presence of the Holy Spirit because others who have the Spirit in them are rejoicing and praising God's great name. Do, do you love this place? Do you love God's people? Are you willing to experience the same kinds of loss and need that Jesus did for the sake of God's people? Am I? Heaven is first about enjoying God and His people. If we don't enjoy Him now, what do we expect heaven to be? It certainly won't be a place where we will be. God is not about to put people that are poochy-lipped, if we can have it, put it that way. You know, it's like a kid who's, you just can't satisfy I've given you this, I've given you this, and they're still mad. God's not going to bring us into his presence like that. The other thing I would encourage you with is this, that we must honor the dignity that God in Christ has prepared us to experience. And this, I think, is what Paul is getting to a little bit when he says that whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise, that we are to think about these things. You are created for more than this world wants to let you experience. You are created with more dignity and more beauty than this world wants to let you have. And we see that by making the most sacred things of life common or by being willing to destroy the most sacred things of life just to make myself happy. Sex, abortion, drugs, alcohol, to the point where I'm an addict, all these idols that we have. And God says, I've prepared you for beauty. I've prepared you for more. Live there. Live there. Turn off the news and grab music that will inspire your soul in the things of the Lord. Write a friend a note of encouragement full of truth that will satisfy their soul in time of need. John, you're on the Isle of Patmos. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Dear friend, you're going through this hard time, and here's how I'm praying for you. You're created for more. You're created for beauty and distinction. Let that mark your life. Let that motivate your life. Let that discipline your life in every part of where you are and what you have, because it will make you hungrier for that presence of the Lord. And it will also be more of a light to this world around us that they are living in a city that will ultimately be destroyed. But we, we are reaching for a city whose founder and perfecter is Christ, our Savior and our King. Do you love Him? Do you want Him? Do you need Him? Then love God's people and love all that is beautiful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the word of God that leads us and directs us to glory. Please help us to see more of your perfection in your word and through those around us that we might be encouraged in our walk. In Jesus' name, amen.